right, give it up for Jesus. And give it up for the worship team. <laughs> Grateful for you guys. Hey guys, it's giving week. So we're gonna get that slide up there for those that uh, are givers. <laughs> so you can pay attention to that. I have the distinct honor today of introducing the guest speaker. I'm gonna read a little bit of his bio here and then I'm gonna add to it. Michael Lombardo is a pastor, international minister, author, and host of Awaken Podcast on Charisma Podcast Network. He met his wife, Selena, while serving in Mozambique with Iris Global, which is Heidi Baker's ministry. Together they've done missions work, traveled itinerantly, and now lead Awaken Dallas, which is uh, a new church plant. Do we have some Awaken Dallas members here this morning? I think so. Michael and Selena are passionate about seeing people encounter God, get equipped, and launched into their callings. They reside here in Dallas and have three beautiful children. But also, for those of you that don't know, Michael was my roommate when I was a student here. So we go way back to the beginning of CFNI days, and I can tell you because I've been with him uh, all throughout these years. He's one of my closest friends on the planet. In fact, I wouldn't, I don't really call him a friend. We call each other brothers. We are brothers, and uh, without them. And I'm, I mean that intentionally because once Selena, Selena came into his life, they are family. They live this stuff out. They're the real deal. Their whole heart is for Jesus and for his people. So I know that what he has for you this morning is going to be impactful. So have your hearts and your ears ready. You know, I was, I was Michael's best man in his wedding when him and Selena got married. And they surrounded me and my wife, Bea, when we were getting married. Selena was our wedding planner. Uh, she made the most beautiful uh, arrangement. I, I can't tell you, there's just lifelong gratitude to these two. They are special individuals to me personally, and they are special within the body of Christ. So if you guys would just stand with me and let's welcome Michael Lombardo. All right, can we stay standing for one second? Hold on, before you sit down. Yes, yes, okay. Welcome everyone, first of all, I love you guys already. I love Christ for the Nation so much with all of my heart. The Lord transformed my life here in such a deep and powerful way. And so before we jump into the message right now, can we just activate our faith together? Can we lock our hearts and minds on Jesus here for a minute, get a little uncomfortable and just, you all have the Holy Spirit, right? And so let this not be another message. I know you guys hear teachings every single day. You hear messages every day, and it's powerful and it's amazing. But let us just lock our mind on the Lord right now. If you pray in the Spirit, then pray in the Spirit. If you want to hum, if you want to be silent, if you want to lift your hands, let's just take a moment. We submit our minds to you right now, Holy Spirit. We submit our heart to you right now, Jesus. We submit our spirit to you right now, Jesus. We present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to you right now. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in this room. Tell them, have your way in me. Mark me, seal me, change me. Let me see you afresh. Let me see you in a way that I've never seen you before. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All the things that are hidden that we don't even know are there, bring them to the surface so that we can see them and we could be transformed into your very image right now. In Jesus' mighty name, you are the king of Christ for the nations. You are the king of the nations. You are the king of glory. We honor you. We revere you. All praise and honor and glory is yours. 
Thank you, God. We submit our minds to the mind of Christ. We yield our hearts to the heart of our Father. And we welcome your voice in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, you guys can sit down now. <laughs> you guys can sit down. Just stay in that space of receive mode. That's all I'm asking for. Because I don't want to come with eloquent speech or another message that you're going to forget. I want there to be a deposit. I want there to be a seed. And if I just say one thing today that resonates with you, that you can grab hold of and you can bring to the Father and it brings transformation in your life, that is what it's all about. Living revelation, not just information, right? I love teaching, I love the word of God, I eat it, I crave the word, I long for the word, but we want the spirit of God to breathe on it, right? And so have your way, Lord. And so I'm excited to be here. I was here from 2009 and I graduated in 2012. And so, and then I went right to Mozambique, Africa. I did not, um, I did not, I think I just sold my stuff, got rid of my stuff, packed a bag and went to harvest school. Anyone know Heidi Baker and uh, harvest school and Iris Global? What a powerful ministry. I remember the first time I saw Heidi speak, she came up here and she sang in tongues for 15 minutes and people did not know what to do with her. You guys ever been in a room that Heidi does that? It's powerful and you either jump in the river or you don't, but... Um, I am so excited to be here. It is always an honor, always a joy to speak to you guys. There's always so much hunger in the room. You guys are world changers. You hear it time and time again. We have a purpose. The hand of God is on our lives. And so I want to bring you something that is the core of, the, of, of, I believe, Christianity. And this is something you might be able to say Amen, 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 because some of the stuff I'm gonna be sharing with you might not be new revelation, but the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter said time and time again, I've come here to remind you of these things, to stir yourself up in these things. And so as I say things, just keep communing with the Lord and receive them into your heart. So are, you guys know what your primary purpose in life is? Do you know what your primary purpose in life is? You don't gotta tell me. I'm not gonna make you say it on the microphone or anything. But raise your hand if you think you know what your primary purpose in life is. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Let's see if y'all are right. John 17, three says, this is eternal life, to know him and the one who sent him. That's Jesus Christ. And so that is your eternal purpose, to be with him and to become like him. That is all of our destiny. That is all of our primary callings and purpose so that we may know him and be transformed into his very image. You are first called to be lovers before you're called to be laborers. You are first called to be worshipers before you're called to be warriors. You are first called to be priests before you're called to be kings and you're first called to be a son or a daughter before you're a servant of the Most High God. And we become the purest servants of God when we know our identity as sons of God. So it's not one greater than the other, it's this one is, I, I'm, I'm a worshiper, I'm a lover of God, I'm a son of God, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, this is who I am, I'm a priest unto the Lord, and then from that place I'm empowered to be a king, I'm empowered to be a co-laborer with the Lord Jesus Christ. The high call is not missions. The high call is not a miracle ministry. The high call is not being a pastor of a church with thousands of members. The high call is not even martyrdom. That is not the high call. According to the Apostle Paul, who had such an impactful ministry that we're still reading his words today, he's still bearing fruit. We're reading his words and we're singing his words to this day. But according to the Apostle Paul, who left such a mark for the kingdom of God, he said in Philippians chapter three, the high call is to know him. This is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter three. And I'm gonna read this real quick to you guys because I love it out of the Amplified Bible. I don't know if you've ever read it out of the Amplified before. And I was gonna read like 
eight verses, but it's like two paragraphs in the Amplified Bible, okay? And so I was like, you know what? That'll be half my message today. So I don't think I'm gonna read it out of the Amplified, but I'm gonna give you a chunk here in the beginning. This is Philippians 3, verse eight out of the Amplified Bible. One verse, it's like five sentences. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I want you guys to feel that. I don't want it just to be words on a page. The overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth, the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. This isn't something that you get one touch from God or a minister lay hands on you one time and now you're just glowing. You don't need to get, you know, this one encounter, I'm just gonna ride for the rest of my life. This is something that we progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with. And this is something that our hearts need to be dedicated to all the days of our life that we would be acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. Do you guys wanna know him more fully and more clearly? I hope that's why you're here. I hope that's why you gave up the you know, different pursuits and I hope that's why you moved across the world or across the United States so that you would get to know him more deeply so that you could be equipped for what he's called you to do in the earth. I know that's true. For me, I was a drug addict, I was a hedonist. I wanted nothing to do with God in my teenage years. I was 14, 15 years old when my father got saved. And my dad, you know, I grew up Catholic, you know, and so I went to a Catholic school for eight years, and then, you know, we're going to mass all of the time during school and on Sundays, and my dad was essentially serving God so that he wouldn't go to hell, right? It was more of religion than relationship, but my mom, she loved the Lord. She prayed in tongues. She put anointed cloths inside my pillowcases at night, and I didn't even know they were there. And so I was like 15 years old, and I'm like, what's this like safety pin? I feel like something jabbing me. She put a safety pin with a cloth in there. I'm like, geez. You know, like that's, I had a Pentecostal mom, if you know what I'm talking about, all right? Anyone else have a Pentecostal mom that just prayed in tongues? I remember my mom's tongue. Shut that a hider, shut that a hider, shut that a hider. All the time, you know, and I was just like, yes, every time, every time my mom prayed for me. But she would quote the Bible to me. She would tell me about the love of the Lord. She led me to the Lord at a very, very young age. But my dad was more about going to church on Sunday. But at 14 years old, when my dad's business was going down the drain a little bit there, he was struggling. My dad was always a wonderful provider. He always took care of my family financially. But then his company, his idol, was struggling, and when that happened, my mom wrote up a salvation prayer for him and he cried out to God in his truck and the Lord answered him. And he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and he was transformed into a completely different person. And then I thought to myself, okay, there's Christians and then there's you guys. Like you take it to a whole nother level. Like you guys are at church four days a week. Like you guys are on, you guys are serving. My dad's an usher, they're wearing suits. I'm like, you guys, like you're taking it to a whole nother level here. And then I made a vow inside of my heart that if it's Christian, I don't want it. And so MTV discipled me at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and I began to chase the things of the world. I began to chase pleasure, I began to chase girls, I began to do drugs, I began to drink. I was in immoral relationships, and I just dove headlong into the things of this world. And for a season, it was fun, at least I thought it was, and then the wages of sin is death, it catches up. You guys know that it catches up to you? It might be okay for a little while, at least you think it is, but then that bite comes in. And then around 17, 18 years old, I began to struggle with depression. I began to get suicidal thoughts. And I never experienced those kind of things before. And then I was in my room and I had a dusty Bible that my sister bought for me in hopes that one day I'd read it. I had a dusty Bible and I used to rip the back pages out with no words on it to smoke weed from. That's the kind of life I was living, all right? I used to smoke the Bible, okay? And so <laughs> I hope I'm not giving anybody ideas in this room. Everyone's sanctified, right, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, let's go. Awaken Dallas right here. I love you guys. 
I love my Wake and Dallas church family. They, I love them so much. They came with full support today. And so um, we're celebrating one year as a church, by the way, coming up on March 23rd. Let's go. We're hosting Brian Simmons, a spiritual father of ours, the lead translator of the Passion Translation. So if you want to know about it, contact one of those guys in that row right there. They'll tell you how to get there. And so, but um, anyways, I, I, I was in my room and I was desperate, okay? And I opened up that dusty Bible. I blew the dust off of the Bible and then I just opened it up. And I don't know what my heart said. I have no clue if I even said words out of my mouth, but I, my, my heart was saying, God, if you're real, like people say you're real, my brother-in-law, my mother, my father, they say they could, we could hear the voice of God. We could experience the presence of God. I've never heard your voice. I've never felt your presence before. They said I could experience that. And so God, I need you. And my heart was broken before God. I, I just, I clung to him in desperation and hope that maybe this God is real. And then I was alone in the room, or at least I thought I was. And the next moment, the presence of God blew into the room in a manifest way, and I felt the warmth of the Father's embrace on my body physically, and I felt love pour into my heart for the first time. Love, like approval, acceptance, just a, an embrace from God, the warmth of his love and his presence, and then I heard him speak for the first time. And it wasn't a booming voice, and it wasn't an angel in my room. It was the still, small voice of the Spirit of God on the inside. And he said to me, son, I have plans for your life. And I'll never forget that moment. Son, I was a rebel. I was a God hater. I was that kid, I was that kid that was forced to go to youth group and was telling all the youth group kids that sin was better than Jesus. I was that guy. I don't know how many I led astray. Just like the Apostle Paul, he, he left casualties behind him. I was like, son, I, I was a rebel. I'm a God hater. Why son? And then a big part of my life is what am I called to? I'm 19 years old. I didn't feel led to do, I didn't know who I was. I don't know what I was on the earth for. So when he said, I have plans for your life, it absolutely transformed me. And in one moment, I went from a drug junkie to a lover of God's presence. I became an addict in a minute, y'all. I became like, because in his presence, there's fullness of joy, and at his right hand, pleasure forevermore. And so everything else is a counterfeit. All the carnal pleasures of this life, the inferior pleasures of this life, that just bring death. And unbelievers aren't the only ones that could dabble into it and enjoy it, okay? We as believers have a choice to be more and more like Christ or to dabble into the things of the world. And it comes with a promise that it will fulfill, it will comfort, it will satisfy, but it doesn't. Because you were created for a superior pleasure. The presence of God filling you, overwhelming you, leading you, and him governing your heart. And anything else will just be completely unsatisfied. And once you taste it, you can't go back to normal living. You can't go back to the way you once lived when you tasted and experienced the presence of God, that he is good. So that's my story. And I began to go on a journey of how can I experience the presence of God on a daily basis? How can this be? This is, it became the pursuit of my life. Has anyone ever read a book or heard of a book called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence? Anybody in here? Raise your hand. Brother Lawrence is a monk in the 1600s that gave his life to the practice of the presence of God. And he said, if I'm gonna preach anything, it's the practice of the presence of God. And I'm, I'm a preacher of the gospel, okay? So I'm not 100% with that. So we gotta preach the gospel, the practice of the presence of God. We gotta preach it all. But, and they all work together. But you know that you could be daily refreshed by the presence of God? You know that you could daily commune with your God and Father. And you know that it doesn't only have to happen in here. You know that it could happen. When I first got saved, I put a little Gideon Bible in my pocket, and I didn't have any Christian friends yet. And I, and I was like, Christians are kind of corny. Like, I love you, Jesus, but I don't want to have any Christian friends. That's what I thought when I first got saved. And then I started going to parties with the Bible in my pocket, and I'm like, I'll drink one beer, not ten. You know, I'll be all right. But then I was in the room with everyone partying and doing drugs, and I just felt like a fish out of water. 
You know why I felt like a fish out of water? Because I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I still can sin, but I died to sin. I don't like it anymore like I used to. It's not my nature. I have a new nature in Christ Jesus. My old self is dead and gone, and I've been resurrected unto a new life. And so I was beginning to get more increasingly uncomfortable in settings like that. And then I would go, people were smoking weed, people would be doing stuff in all different rooms. And I would get in the bathroom with my little Gideon Bible and the presence of God would flood that room. And I would just be weeping as people are drinking, people are doing all kinds of stuff in all the different rooms, taking ecstasy, doing drugs. And I'm experiencing the glory of God. It doesn't matter where you are, he is there with you. He's with you in this auditorium. He's with you in your car. He's with you at the, when you're valeting for work. He's with you at your job. He's with you at your house with all the brokenness and you don't want to go visit your home because of all the different problems in your family. He's right there in the midst of it with an invitation for you to become more like him and to love like him and to experience him in the midst of every situation in your life. Hmm, I love that about Jesus. I love that he's accessible. Don't you love that he's so accessible? And we could access him anytime we want because he's not far. Because he broke down the barrier of separation. You guys know the gospel? He tore everything out of the way that separated you from God and he invited you into the holy place. You live in the holy place whether you know it or not. We just need to be aware. We just need to draw near in our hearts so that he could draw near to us in a manifest way. He is so accessible. It is beautiful. Hallelujah. He died for that accessibility. I'm going to say something that's going to sound simple, but I really want you to digest it. If you are to learn to do anything in this Christian life, I want you to learn to do this one thing. Learn to pray. Wow. Phew, massive revelation. You know, I hear this. You probably hear this every day. Learn to pray. I've been saved for 18 years, and I am so grateful that I learned to pray because it doesn't just happen to you. You don't just have T.D. Jakes pray for you, or you don't just have Michael Culliano's pray for you, and all of a sudden you know how to pray. You don't just visit a powerful church one time, you get one touch from the Lord, and now you learn how to pray. It is the habit of prayer. It is a beautiful spiritual discipline that we bring into our lives that forever transforms us and it carries over into every season of our lives. So if you are to learn to do anything in this time, learn to pray. And I, I'm grateful. When I was a student here, I, I didn't have to work. And I know that's not everybody's story, okay? I know that. You guys are paying for your school bills. You guys are working. Some of you are on scholarship. There's all different situations here, okay? But whether you have 20 minutes in your truck when you're driving back and forth or you have to wake up a half an hour earlier, one of my favorite things I've heard somebody say recently is don't pray as you can't, pray as you can. And what he meant by that was if you can't pray for an hour, pray for 30 minutes. If you can't pray for 30 minutes, pray for 10 minutes. If you can't pray for 10 minutes, pray for one minute. Let's just make progress, right? And if you can't pray in the house of prayer, then pray in your apartment. And if you can't pray in your apartment, then walk around the track and pray. Just figure out where your heart feels most comfortable and most connected with your creator and father. And just take baby steps. And the Lord loves it. Because we could come to Christ for the nations and we could learn to be prophetic and we could learn to be a worship leader and we could learn to be a missionary and we could learn to be all kinds of things, but are you learning to pray? Because that's what's gonna carry you. And I'm not just talking from someone who's a full-time pastor. I've been a missionary. I've been an itinerant minister. I've I've, before Uber, I drove limos around to make money for my family. I worked with a shovel in my hand with my father, you know, just out in, on construction sites in New Jersey. I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm in business. I'm, I'm actually bivocational right now. My life is very demanding. There's a lot of things. Like I work and I travel and I'm a, a sales manager for a roofing company, a sales roofing company. And I also started a church. We planted a church. And I've got a beautiful wife and I've got three children. Life's busy, right? Life's super busy. But if I did not learn to pray years and years ago, 
And if his presence wasn't the satisfaction of my life, the joy of my life, I'd be living very depleted right now. I'd be living continually off of fumes, or I'd be living off the anointing. And you know what happens when you just live off the anointing? There's a difference between the anointing and the presence of the Lord. The anointing is for ministry. The presence of God is because he's your Abba. He loves you. And it's his presence that delights your heart, that fulfills you, that heals you, that comforts you, that gives you everything that you need. Am I pacing too much? I'm from Jersey, and I get excited. Is that all right, everybody? I know, I know Pastor Adam McCain. He likes, to, he likes to walk around. He was here when I was a student as well. And so we, I could get excited here, right? I could walk around? All right. Why is this so important? I can't live off my pastor's history with God. I can't live off my mother and father's history with God. I can't live off of Pastor Adam McCain's history with God. I can't live off my favorite teacher's history with God. I need to develop a history of God for myself. And that is my admonishment today. That is my admonishment to you guys. I had a vision when I was here at Christ for the Nations, and it was a vision of a vast ocean, so beautiful that I could not see beyond it. And I saw some people on the beach, in the sand, playing with toys, you know, making sand castles. And I saw other people just dipping their toe. It's a little bit too cold, you know, kind of going back and forth. It's a little cold, but they're going in, a little bit splashing around. And then I saw knee deep, people that were knee deep, throwing a football, you know, just enjoying it a little bit. And then I saw people that just went out. They just went out. And, and they fully immersed themselves in the ocean. And they let the ocean take them where the ocean wanted to take them. You know what I'm saying? Because when you get inside of an ocean, we don't have too many oceans here in Texas. You gotta drive a while to get to an ocean. But when an ocean takes you, like, how did I get on this side of the beach, right? How did I get on this side of the beach? I was on that side of the beach. And when you experience the deep things of God, when you are dunked in the presence of God and you hear him speak to you and speak life and speak promise into you, man, it's hard to go back to that shore. And you know, the deeper you get in the ocean of God, the deeper you get in his fullness of his beauty, of his love, of his presence, the deeper you get, it's harder to swim back to the shore. You got to use a little bit more energy. You get a little tired swimming back to the shore, right? And there has been times in my life where I was here at Christ for the Nations Institute. And and I remember temptation and different things trying to whisper to me. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I could just maybe do this or I could just maybe do that. But then the voice of the Spirit of God, it's like I couldn't. It's like I couldn't because I've tasted and seen because he's delivered me from the bondage of the past. Why would I go back to it? Why would I go back like a pig in the mud and roll around in the muck that he delivered me from? And I literally almost felt like I didn't have a choice even though I did. But it's because I allowed him to take me into the deep end. And the reason why some of us go and just dabble and just teeter back and forth into things of this world and the things of God is because we've never allowed him to take us into the deep end yet. We've never allowed him to fully immerse us. We've never told him, take my life. We've never told him, have it all. We've never told him, your will be done, not my own. We haven't prayed prayers like that. And so it's easy to just refresh ourselves in God's presence at chapel and then go back to some other stuff, right? Right? It's truth, so I'm gonna say it with confidence. When you've tasted of his presence, nothing else will do. It's very hard to build a habit of prayer when you're extremely busy. Take advantage of your time now. Take advantage of this time now because you're not gonna get it back. You're not gonna get this holy time back where you get to worship every morning and every afternoon and you hear from some of the most dynamic kingdom builders that grace this earth. You're never gonna get this time back. You're gonna look back and say, why didn't I take full advantage of that? Why didn't I get on my face in the front? Why did I let people's opinions hold back my worship? Why did I not dunk myself in the deep end when I was here at CFNI? And I don't want that to be any of your story because workers burn out, but lovers burn on and on and on and on. Lovers are gonna keep on burning and lovers make the greatest workers, I'm telling you right now. There's a lot of burnt out missionaries, burnt out pastors, burnt out worship leaders. But if you abide and if you learn the practice of prayer and you put your heart to it like the holy habit and the holy discipline that it is, I'm telling you, you'll live refreshed and you'll live under the power of the spirit for your calling. 
Thank you, Jesus. Listen, because if you build a habit of prayer right now, it doesn't matter how busy you get. It doesn't matter, you get married, you start having kids, you become a youth pastor, you get a job, God leads you to go back to your, 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 the town that you grew up in and you do, because I had friends that thought they were gonna be in full-time ministry when they left Bible school, but God led them back to their hometown for a little while, that happens, because God wants to do a work in us. And I remember, you know, like, if you learn the habit of prayer now, and when God puts you into a new season that is draining, that maybe you're dying to some stuff, maybe you're just busier than you thought you'd be, because this is life, your heart is always gonna call you back to that place of prayer. Your heart, it's always, and hey, you might just for a little while, I'm busy or distracted, you know, we're hardened in our hearts a little bit, and we're going about our lives, but you'll never forget that place. This is, this is just, I've, I've experienced this because from 2018 to present day, I've been in business along with ministry. And I didn't imagine that for myself. That was a total shock. Will Hart, anyone know who Will Hart is by any chance? Will Hart prophesied over me in 2013 that I was gonna be in business and that God was gonna bless me to be a blessing financially and I was gonna be in business. And I thought like, <laughs> he prophesied over like 30 people. I was like the last one. I'm like, you missed it, bro. <laughs> you know, It's full-time ministry for me. I'm just preaching the gospel to the day I die and God's gonna provide for me. That was my thought process. And amen, it's a, it's a great heart. That's a great thought process. But the Lord likes to sneak up on you sometimes with some stuff, doesn't he? He likes to sneak up with some things he didn't expect. And then in 2018, five years later, the Lord led me to Dallas to work for one of my close friends. And I got involved in business. And for the first time, I felt the anointing and the presence of God on my life in the business world. And that was wild. And that was a total shocker. But in that season, I had to learn to stay connected, to stay abiding, to continue my practice of prayer because it doesn't matter how on fire you once were, that could start getting dimmer over time if you don't guard the flame. We need to guard the flame. Guard it with all diligence because you hunger for what you feed on. You hunger for what you feed on. What are you feeding on right now? What are we daily feeding on? I'm not saying that our phones are sinful or whatever and not to be on your phones. I'm not gonna be that guy that's like, put your iPhone away. I've got an iPhone and I'm daily fighting to put that thing away and trying to figure out boundaries in my life so I'm not sucked into the world that the world, you know, like all the things. You guys ever look at your phone for hours and like, and then just like you're on reels and you're just scrolling and then you kind of come out of that world and you're like, I got sucked into a world. Has that ever happened to you? Like literally, I got sucked into a world when I could be totally locked in my heart to the kingdom of heaven, getting downloads from God, encountering the Lord in a deep way. And I'm not saying you can't look at a reel. I'm not trying to be religious. I'm not, trust me, hear me, I'm not. But what I'm trying to say is if that's what you constantly feed on, then that's what you're gonna constantly hunger for. But... If you constantly feed on the word, if you make a habit of prayer, that's what you'll feed on. You'll begin to hunger for those things. I've got a friend of mine who's in business and he, we ran together here at Bible school. We ran together here at CFNI and he's making a lot of money. God anointed him to start a business that's blessing a lot of people's lives. And, and it's amazing, and I, and I love him so much with all of my heart. And I could see, because it's easy for the world to kind of get its claws in, and it's easy to get distracted with all the things that we're doing, but I could see him in any moment, he could turn his attention, he could turn his affection to Jesus and be overwhelmed by the presence, when one moment he was just totally locked into something else, or maybe doing something he should have been doing, or maybe pursuing things that he should but. Because he learned the habit of prayer, he knows how to turn his heart to God, be refreshed, repent, and move on. That is beautiful. But that only comes from developing history with God. And that only comes by receiving life-giving revelation from his lips that begin to form you spiritually, that become bedrocks in your life. Because you can hear me preach it, but when the Lord says something to you personally, when he breathes life on a scripture to you personally, that becomes a living stone in your heart. That becomes a living reality and a living stone. You are a house being built up right now in every season, in this season, in future seasons, into a house becoming fully mature in Christ Jesus. You know, I began to think about 
I begin to think about altars. And, you know, altars have a lot, I'm not gonna break this down because I can go into like a three-part series on this, okay? You know, now we, we don't have to build physical altars now, thank God. We don't need to kill lambs and sheep and animals now, thank God. But I began to think about altars because I was reading in the book of Genesis and you see Abraham, you see Isaac, you see Noah building altars to God in significant places. And I was, oh, it's just my heart was just moved by it. Like, what, what's going on? Abraham was pursued by God. He encountered God, and God gave him a promise that he was gonna be a father of many nations. And then what does Abraham do? He builds an altar there to commemorate it, to remember it. That was a place that he encountered God. And that's what altars are. They're a place of sacrifice, but they're also a place where heaven meets earth, where encounter is. And our hearts are now an altar that we rend to the Lord. And he burns on the inside of us. But the beautiful thing, you just see it time and time again. God speaks to Abraham again. And he says, look at all these plains. This land is gonna be yours. And what does Abraham do? It says he calls on the Lord his God in that place and he builds an altar. And then it says Abraham actually moved forward I'm not gonna go through all the scriptures right now, but he moved forward and he went back to that altar to call on the name of the Lord again. That place where he once encountered the Lord and that place where he once cried out to God. He went back to that place. And then you see God telling him to build an altar when God asked for Isaac, his son. That was a completely different thing. That was an altar of sacrifice. And I'm telling you right now, there's something about this because Jesus said, return to your first love. Do the things that you did at first. And I made an altar in the spirit in that prayer room here at Christ for the Nations. I didn't build an altar. There wasn't any physical thing that I did. I didn't do a ritual or anything like that. But in that prayer room, I encountered God in ways that absolutely revolutionized my existence. And now every time I walk into that prayer room, it's like, whew, remember when I met you here, Lord? Remember when you spoke to me here, Lord? It becomes like a portal that just brings you right back to that moment of encounter. And in those moments, we return to our first love. We feel those feelings that we once felt when we encountered God in that place. I've made an altar here at this altar. The altar is a place where God alters you. He changes you. And, and it's not, it has nothing to do with this exact space, but it has to do with the fact that I felt the electricity of God th go through my body in this exact spot when Cindy Jacobs was here and giving prophetic words. And I, I told my friend, catch me because I, don't, I think I'm gonna fall. And then I just opened my heart to the Lord and I just shot down. I slammed on the ground. He caught me. And God spoke to me words that I'll never forget in this exact location. And it has nothing to do with this location necessarily, but it's the remembrance, it's the fragrance, it's the, it's, it's, I, I walk here and I remember it. Huh, same carpet. <laughs> no, it's not, I don't think so. Oh, it's funny. So yes, it's these beautiful altars. Like I'm in Mozambique, when I'm thinking about when I was in Mozambique and I was in a mud hut and my phone had no service and I couldn't, use my phone or go on the internet, but I was in a mud hut with my Bible open and the wind would just blow into the mud hut and I would sing Will Reagan and United Pursuit on my little iPod. You guys remember iPods? You guys never had an iPod before, most of you. Oh, no, wow, I'm at that age where I can talk about iPods or something like that and people never used them before. Okay, I'm 36, I'm not that old, right? Am I old? Yeah, I'm old, thank you, bro. Appreciate the truth. We got truth tellers in the place. But I remember with my iPod with 1,050 billion songs on it, right? That you just download and just go through it. And Will Reagan and United Pursuit. And you know what? There's songs that are altars for me. When I, if you want to burn like you first burned, go back to those songs that you would listen to where God encountered you years ago. For me, one of the first songs I wept to was Carrie Job, The More I Seek You. The more I seek you. Right here, see if and I. The more I love you. And I was in the heavy metal music. I was in the punk rock music before I got saved. And then someone gave me a Christ for the Nations Institute album. And that's how I got here. God used it. And I was listening to Carrie Job sing like an angel about seeking God. And I was weeping like a baby in my room. Like, who am I? This isn't even me anymore. 
You know, like you're like, I'm realizing I'm a new creation. I never would have wept to a soft, you know, song like this before. But sometimes you just gotta put on the more I seek you and just go back mentally into that place. A couple Sundays ago, we had um, a worship team spontaneously you know, come up. My wife invited them. They're, they were just, they had no clue we were gonna invite them to come up. And, and they began to sing a song by Upper Room about if your word didn't meet me in that night season, I would have been abandoned. If your word didn't meet me. And I literally went back to my first love in a second because it was like, I remembered those times where in my night season, I would have been, I w- I would have been broken and nothing if God didn't show up. And you need to just, where has God encountered you? I've made an altar in seasons of my life in my truck, driving back and forth to work because that was sometimes the only time that I had with the Lord. Because your kids wake you up at six o'clock, you know, and there's a diaper to be changed. And there's, you gotta get to work, you gotta get changed. There's people calling you, but shut off my phone and I would just worship in my truck and I would be intentional with that. And it was just that place of first love. And so... I want to encourage you today. Allow the Lord to build some altars in your life. Have some sacred spaces with the Lord. Build that habit of prayer, that place of prayer. There's something, and some of you guys are thinking about places here on this campus. I, I remember walking around where the, where the, I think it's YFN's over there, right, with the track, and they meet over there. I remember I, just, I used to walk around that track when nobody was there. And I would just pop on my, 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 iPod, my iPods. I would pop them on. And I would just walk around. And I remember just sweet refreshing would wash over my soul. And I remember challenging myself to join the evangelism team. And I remember being intimidated and scared. But I knew that God called me to be a minister of the gospel. And I remember going into high schools with a pastor, a guy named Dustin Sample. I went into high schools. And I remember feeling a bit nervous to share the gospel with some high schoolers. And I remember going into the bathroom and just, just getting away from the people that I was ministering with and getting away from the high school students. And I remember just saying, I need you, Jesus. I need you. You know, it's that simple sometimes. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, you don't gotta pray for an hour in the Holy Spirit for God to touch your heart. That's great when you have an hour to do that. But sometimes it's the simple, I need you. I have you, you're here. And I remember just waves of grace washing over my heart. You know, because the grace of God is your power for everyday living. The grace of God is the Holy Spirit wind in your sails that pushes you forward. And when you humble your heart in the presence of God, he pours out grace. And when I just leaned in, I need you. And I remember, if I walked into that, if I, if I would walk into that bathroom today, I don't remember what school it, it is, I'd remember when I was on this campus, I remember just driving around. Sometimes you just need to go back to those places or go back to those songs. The beautiful thing about altars, and there's all different scriptures within Exodus where Moses was creating altars, you know, the, the, you know, the temple of Solomon where they had to make things a very specific way. And we can go into all of that. But God told Moses when the Israelites were in the wilderness to bring unhewn stones to make the altar. They had to be unhewn. Man could not taint them with their works. Man could not taint the stones with their works. He said, the broken earth, take it as it is, the broken earth, the natural elements that I've created, create an altar out of those things. Do not fashion them. Do not add your little human touch to them. And that is what altars were made out of. You know, God loves your brokenness and he loves to meet you in, I'm not saying he loves your sin. What I'm saying is he loves to meet you in your brokenness because a contrite spirit he will not despise. And how will we get to know him if we don't know we need him? In some of the hardest seasons of our life, that's how we get to know him the most. In some of our most painful, heart-wrenching, how do I get over this fear? How do I get over this rejection? How do I get over this pain? How do I do it? Instead of carrying around our broken human stones with us, having them drag us down everywhere they go, take those broken human stones and create an altar with them. Do you hear what I'm saying? Bring your broken human stones in the presence of God and he will not despise them. In fact, he commanded those stones to be broken just how they are. 
And he accepts you just how you are. He sees you just where you're at right now. And he loves you. And he knew what he was getting into when he chose you. And he knew the sin that you would break yourself with when he called you before the foundation of the world. And he knew your weaknesses. And he knew your prayerlessness. And he knew your lack of passion. He knew your religion. He knew your pain. He knew your idolatry. He knew your immorality. He knew it all. And he chose you. And he loves you just the same. And he likes you. And he delights in you. And he delights to make all things new in your life. So take your unhewn stones. Take your broken earth. You know that you are human. You have a div the, the divine spirit of God on the inside of you. But you're also human and that's good. That God wanted you human with his divine spirit on the inside of you. And he knows that we're all beauty mingled with brokenness. And if we could just learn to take our brokenness to our God and Father and just say, I need you. Here's what I have. Here's my offering. Here's what I can create for you. This is what I can give you. Take that. And he just delights in that. And he will encounter you in that place. And you will never forget. You will never forget. You know that I rejoice in my brokenness. You know that I rejoice in my neediness. I am a needy one. Are you? Or do you think you're great and you don't need God's help? Because, man, I'm telling you right now, we need him. Every moment, every hour, we need him. And if we don't know we need him, we've stepped into pride. And if we don't humble ourselves in recognition, then he will humble us himself. And it's out of goodness and love because he knows that we're broken when we think we're whole. You're complete in Christ, not complete in yourself. We need him every moment. We need him every hour. Thank you, Jesus. Got a few minutes here. I'm gonna end with that. Thank you, Father. Let's do this. Yeah, let's have someone on the piano come up here real quick. I just wanna pray for you guys. Can we stand up together? Can we stand up? And here's what I would like to do. Christiana told me that the RAs are also here to minister. Listen, guys, if you want prayer from me, you know that all the RAs have the Spirit of God? <laughs> you guys know that? My wife has the Spirit of God. I have the Spirit of God. Can we call up a few people to pray? I just really feel like there's some hearts right now that the Lord wants to minister to. How can we do this with lunch? I guess people at 12 like, could be free to go to lunch, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how all that works anymore. I'm just going with the flow. I hope no one gets mad at me. All right. I just want to, there's something about being honest with where you're at. There's something about wanting, expressing, coming up, stepping out of yourself. Who cares what people think? And saying, I want prayer right now. I want prayer right now. I don't recognize how much I need him. I want to develop that place of prayer, but I've been beating myself up. I've tried and I'm not good at it. You know, people keep telling me I got to pray. People keep, people keep telling me that, you know, I need to do this, but life's so busy and I'm not doing it and I'm beating myself up about it. I know what that's like. I could be very hard on myself. But do you know that self-condemnation just brings a revelation of a pure heart? Because you wouldn't beat yourself up if you didn't have a pure heart to do what was right and holy. The Lord told me that one time. He goes, take the boxing gloves off. Stop beating yourself up. The more you beat yourself up, the weaker you become. The weaker you become, the more you give yourself the things you should not give yourself to. And he said, you know, when you struggle with self-condemnation, that just reveals that you have a heart that loves me. You have a heart that wants to be planted in me, that wants to turn to me. I love that. Shake off the self-condemnation, that's not me but I want you to see the purity of your heart. And so don't be, come on, come on up right now. If you want prayer, we wanna pray for you, okay? I wanna pray for you. And we're gonna leave a couple minutes. You could be on, yes, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm just gonna leave a couple minutes here. And if you want me to pray for you too, you can come up here. This is my, this is my wife. She'll pray for you as well. And if you're 
in your seat, that is totally fine. Just take a moment right now before you go to lunch, before you continue your day, and just ask him to teach you how to receive his love, to teach you how to pray. Just like the apostle said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to abide. Teach us how to practice your presence. Teach us how to find our all in all in you alone. Teach us to return to to, to my first love. Teach me. Just talk to him right now. And pray for those who are up front right now because they've humbled themselves to come up. them to continue ministering if you uh if you need ministry we've still got some of our RAs that are available to pray with you but it's noon time and we dismiss you officially thank you you've been very um honoring and not moving until we dismiss you we love you have a great day believing for a great T&E tonight so don't miss out